So again, we're going to be addressing the issue of what should be your preferred anti-bone resorptive therapy. And Roger actually was one of the first people to describe the role of rank and rankle in myeloma, so it's appropriate that he's chairing this session. So bisphosphonates, as you know, are potent inhibitors of bone loss, but their potency varies greatly depending on their side chain, particularly the R2, the early molecules were methyl halide side chains, and then we got into amino side chains, and then aminidazole side chains, and you can see at the bottom the Z drug is 100,000 times more potent than when we started with a tidronate way back when with uh, studies from Andrew Belt showing it, if anything, was worse than not getting the drug. So we published data in the 90s showing that pomidronate reduced skeletal events in myeloma patients with lytic bone disease. And then we began our expedition with zoledronic acid actually in 1995, moving from phase one, two to three, and showed that in a large study of myeloma and breast cancer, that it really was an equivalency, except for there was a difference in multiple vent analysis suggesting that the zoledronic acid was superior to the older drug, pomidronate. But there have been a number of studies from our lab and many others suggesting these drugs have profound anti-tumor effects, directly inducing apoptosis through partially preventing prenylation of GTPases, effects on RAS, other similar proteins, indirect effects in terms of reducing anti-apoptotic growth factors, anti-angiogenic effects that we have shown in terms of decreasing angiogenic factors, recent work in our lab showing preventing endothelial cell development and so-called angiotraction. And certainly work in laboratories show macrophages polarized from M2 to M1 and their TAMs are tumor-associated macrophages in the presence of bisphosphonates. And there's certainly a plethora of data in myeloma, many other tumor types suggesting synergism with other active drugs. And then, of course, the studies mostly from Germany showing effects on the gamma delta T cells and in combination with other immune modulators, possibly anti-tumor effects outside of even cancers that involve the bone. Clinically, these studies were done earlier with hints from frontline trials from Mexico, studies that I did with many others, and then the McCloskey study, the last three trials with zoledronic acid and the weaker molecule clodronate. And then, of course, the MRC myeloma 9 trial from Dr. Morgan, showing that among myeloma patients, nearly 2,000 randomized to see, receive either zoledronic acid monthly or clodronate, which is like I like to say morphine versus baby aspirin, there was a demonstrated not only an improvement in terms of skeletal endpoints, but impressively in overall survival, favoring patients who receive zoledronic acid compared with those who receive clodronate daily orally. That also showed, as you see in the bottom, a progression-free survival. And then uh, the story began with rank ligand and rank, and we know, as you can see in the slide, the effects of the rankle binding rank, driving osteoclasts, then OPG, kind of the rheostep, blocking this interaction. But trying that clinically wasn't such a good thing, but then uh, the group at Amgen developed the denosumab monoclonal antibody, which basically gums up the rankle up here and prevents it from, finding, from uh, binding rank, and therefore you don't make osteoclasts. And of course, this is been tested in a number of different cancer types and approved across types such as prostate and breast. When given uh, monthly, it certainly appears to be quite active, reduced skeletal events, and certainly comparable, if not superior, to zoledronic acid in those settings. So then there was uh, one trial done involving some myeloma patients, 190 in the Henry trial. That was a subset of the trial basically comparing patients with solid tumors other than breast or prostate cancer with bone metastasis or myeloma, the 190 were randomized to monthly DMAB or subcutaneous zoledronic, or sorry, subcutaneously or zoledronic acid, four milligrams monthly. And it did show non-inferiority in the trial. And then when one looked at more detail at the subset of the 190 myeloma patients, 
There was some concern because there was a doubling of deaths in the arm that received the DMAV, 28 deaths versus zoledronic acid. And overall survival was actually inferior, but this was a subset, you know, represented like 12% of the total t database. So was this simply a subset analysis? Was it some kind of anti-tumor effect, which was being observed with the Z drug, but not the D drug? Or was it some unknown negative effect of DMAV? So that led to the large clinical trial that Dr. Raji just reported in, on, on in her talk, the randomized double-blind trial comparing DMAV to zoledronic acid for patients with myeloma bone disease. So as you've heard, this was a huge trial, 1,700 patients who were randomized to DMAB monthly or the Z drug monthly. And uh, then there was a look at, of course, skeletal-related events, a number of other endpoints you heard about progression-free survival, overall survival, as multiple skeletal events, and as well as side effects. So these data looks like don't look a lot different. There's absolutely no difference in terms of the impact of this on the primary endpoint, and that was time to first schedule event, which is the same endpoint we used in our first trial with pomidronate versus placebo, which we began 28 years ago, believe it or not. And then a number of secondary endpoints were looked at, time to first schedule event, cumulatively, time to first and subsequent schedule events. And you can see uh, it's quite uh, remarkable here that the numbers here of events are pretty darn, and these two events are absolutely identical, endpoints, p-values, there's absolutely no difference. So these are kind of look-alike drugs actually accomplishing the same thing. There was a mention of a 40 event difference between the arms. I actually haven't seen that data, but certainly, as you and I know, that could be just statistical gobbledygook because that's not really statistically different. And if you look at overall survival, there certainly is no difference either between the arms. There was this exploratory analysis on progression-free survival, but certainly not translating to any overall survival differences, including inferiority, which was the concern from the first trial. Now, if you look at safety, the adverse events leading to investigational product discontinuation, there's really no difference, slightly more with DMAB than with the Z drug, and adverse events leading to study discontinuation, again, slightly more over here, but to assume that somehow the Z drug is causing enough renal events to impact the ability of patients to stay on it is certainly not being demonstrated. And I certainly haven't seen that in my clinic, that's for sure. And when those events occur, it's very easy to solve them. We certainly give the drug slower. CMAX seems to be the key, although Novartis has in their package insert doses the key, or AUC. So if you look specifically at ONJ, there's a consistent higher incidence of ONJ amongst, among all the trials among patients getting DMAV than zoledronic acid, although it's not statistically significant in this study. Now there is a mention of renal toxicity, potentially associated. I like the word potentially because I've never seen any data to tell me what that actually means. What is a renal event in the studies and what did it do to the patient's course? Certainly didn't impact the ability of patients to stay on study drug. There's no difference between patients staying on, discontinuing, holding drug. We don't see any different. Now the issue is cost. And we just heard from uh, Dr. Rajay that she recognizes there's a profound difference in cost. The annual drug costs of DMAB about 23.5. The Z drug 607, 30 time to 39 times more. If you do your math, that's about $2.3 billion more a year if we were treating all our patients with DMAB instead of zoledronic acid. Now, we've heard from this STOPEC analysis that perhaps there's some kind of an economic benefit. I'd like to find out if that was independently done outside of the group in Thousand Oaks at Amgen. Because certainly, if you do your math, there's 40 more events and they are occurring over two years. That means there's 20 more events per year. That would mean it would be about $100 million per event. I don't think that that's actually economically what's going on here to show this period of the drug. I would actually argue very much so that many skeletal events are not associated 
with clinical intervention. For example, many of these events that occur, such as rib fractures, vertebral compression fractures, many of these are just x-ray findings. So I'm not sure how they were defining that. I'd really have to see the analysis. But I would tell you that cost is pretty prohibitive. So what we've observed from the phase three data is there's no difference in time to first skeletal related event between the two arms. There's no difference in overall survival. There's a consistent higher incidence of O and J and DMAV across trials. They're not always statistically significant. And although we're seeing 7% differential in renal events, what are these events doing? Are they leading to anything clinically significant? I don't know. And there's no difference in drug or study discontinuation between the arms. If anything, there's a slight predominance in the DMAB arm, and the drug's a lot more costly. So in my little cartoon, we have in the center to be or not to be, Z or D, and around it you can see that there's 30 times, nine times higher cost of DMAB. There's no difference in the primary event. There's no difference in the overall survival. There's slightly more O and J, and again, renal events, I'm not sure what's happening with them. So I would tell you that zoledronic acid remains the drug of choice for nearly all of your myeloma patients. I'm using DMAB now in patients with significant renal failure, particularly early on in the course of the disease. When you want to reverse the renal failure, you do not want to give any further insult on the kidney with the potential zoledronic acid. But once the renal function improves, certainly zoledronic acid is fine to use. In addition, if your patient is irreversibly on dialysis, there's no reason to use, not to use the zoledronic acid. The cat's out of the bag, you're not gonna reverse renal failure. You can't do anything and in terms of harm by giving zoledronic acid. And if you have a patient with ongoing significant infusion reactions with zoledronic acid, and we see this occasionally, this is certainly an alternative. And very rarely, and I mean very rarely, patients can have severe intractable bone pain immediately following the first zoledronic acid infusion. You cannot use it. This may be an option for that group. We really don't know because we don't have a lot of those out there. And I thank you very much. <laughs>